Hi, everybody. Do I sound okay? Hope I sound okay. Um, well, this was all explained, so I hope your mouth waters some over the course of the reading, um, and we will fulfill all your desires by the end. This chapter takes place in a small town called Fossil Fink Falls. It's a very tiny mining town in Anthracite County, Pennsylvania. It's very remote, and it only has a single road to get in and out of town. So on a day like this, you can understand that might be a bit problematic if the road should get flooded. Um, and because this town is so small, they don't have a hospital. They just have an underfunded clinic when people have medical problems. The clinic is more state of the hobby than state of the art, and it only has three nurses and one doctor, all of whom you're going to be meeting. And this doctor splits his time among several similar clinics throughout the county, and the clinic is in a renovated farmhouse. This chapter is called A Promise Fulfilled. When the pregnant teenager came to the clinic, she seemed so serious, dressed to the zeros in a plaid maternity dress and clogs. She entered the front door with eyes that seemed haunted, as if layers of ghosts lived inside her. And as she approached the front desk, she spoke in the calm words of someone who'd tucked pain in a back pocket. I think, she told the nurse on duty, I'm ready for my baby. Nurse Molly B. had never seen this auburn-haired girl before, despite having worked in the clinic for years. And Nurse B. paid attention to every who's who in Fossil Fink Falls. Plump, yet perpetually famished, B. stuffed her soul with fantasies of being a gossip columnist. But since she was stuck in a boondock that had long ago been strip-mined down to infertility, all she could gossip about were people as trapped as she. So she scrutinized this girl and, aha! combed in on a naked ring finger. Your husband, Nurse B asked. Know you've made your way here? We can call and tell him. The teenaged patient smiled politely. I'm not married. The thrill propelled Nurse B backward in her chair. She composed herself, adjusting her lacquered hairdo. You've been seeing the doctor at another clinic? It'll take him time to get to us, but I can track him down. The girl shrugged. I've been doing my own doctoring. I'll just see him when he comes in. No doctor. All right, B said. You need to fill out some forms. You are insured, hmm? I have money. The girl reached for a pen, and Nurse B mentally paparazzied every detail. No jewelry, no cosmetics. So she could broadcast this story later to any ear within drooling distance. It would provide entertainment for at least a week. Nurse B had friends all over this Pennsylvania Valley. Little did she know how widespread her audience would eventually be. Interview with Celeste from Spiritual Nudity Movement Today. People still ask me if I can remember my birth. I guess they figure that since it made such headlines for a while, I should somehow have it imprinted on my mind. But of course, I can't. I wish I could. Was I scared in my mother's womb? Sad? Or too preoccupied with myself to notice she died? I hate to think so, but I've been intimate with lots of people. And I've learned that when we're caught up in our own mess, we don't think of others. No one's above this. Despite what your readers might believe, not even me. The teenager was breathing normally. So once B freeze-framed the visual highlights of the pregnant girl's body, she set about investigating the girl's written information. She glanced at the papers piling up on the desk and gagged. The girl couldn't be a stranger. Her address wasn't some remote city, but the old school right outside town. No, it had been a school, B corrected herself, but then closed ages ago after the coal company went bankrupt and families left in search of work. For years, the old school sat forgotten with weeds of every nastiness growing high. Then the property was bought by a stranger, Edwina Kippelbaum Runtoon Kelly, a wealthy eccentric from New York, who imported her utopian ideas to Fossil Fink Falls and turned the school into an orphanage. She called it Natch, the Kelly home. Kids came from all over the country, not only the truly orphaned, but also kids whose parents had other places to be or other people to love. Now pink and set behind an iron gate, the orphanage was known as a place where kids ran about unsweetened, unfiltered, and unpreserved, free of additives, religion, and television.
They were educated. The older kids taught the younger. But they were also allowed, no, emboldened, to create themselves, to pick their own names, develop their own talents. And how outlandish were the talents they developed, or so went the rumors. Kids who could understand the language of animals, or catch a piece of sky in a jar, or turn other people into trees. To what end these talents were to be developed, no one knew. Speculation bubbled up from time to time, but always simmered back to the stock understanding that these were just rumors, possibly even generated by Edwina Kelly herself, who was, as far as the locals were concerned, a little cuckoo. After all, this was the lady who'd installed an iron gate across her drive that declared, to know oneself and be a squire, to serve the world and be a knight. You have to be kind of flaky to do that. Locals had always steered clear of the orphanage, though not just because of Edwina Kelly. When the place first opened years ago, Edwina Kelly had marched the children into town one morning, a ragtag menagerie dressed in oddball clothes. Tall and short, boys and girls, post-diaper to post-puberty, they wore a hodgepodge of clothes that broke every fashion barrier. Mod, macrame, greaser, mini, rock star, migrant, Maoist, hootenanny, Poker tourist, cardigan allurist, black leather purist, American tourist, spandexed, cross-saxed, Tex-Mex, and jeans. And as this motley crew had crossed the town green, Glooper Flugel, who was working off his morning blur at the coffee shop, peered out the window and proclaimed they looked like a circus from hell. They give me a fear, he told everyone. Best stay away from them. The few who witnessed subsequent dawn marches agreed with Gloop, but soon Miss Kelly and her orphans ceased the walks. Thereafter, they rarely came to town, and Glooper's pronouncement held sway. Nurse B, however, wasn't sure she concurred with Gloop. The orphans seemed decent, maybe a little rambunctious and sacrilegious, but they never displayed any weirdo talents, and though they were rather fast, at least they used birth control. Until now, that is. Nurse B squinted at the girl. You're not one of the orphans we've seen before, she said. You new out there? I'm not in the orphanage, the girl said. I live at the orphanage. My name is Marina Kelly. My mother is the director. Nurse Speed blinked and floated an image of Edwina Kelly on the girl's face. The old double exposure trick. Most effective genetic test ever devised by gossip kind. Well, what do you know? Same nose, same cheekbones, same thick lips. I didn't know Miss Kelly had a child. It's not exactly new news. Shouldn't she be here with you? She's got a class to teach. A class? This is more important than a class. The hospital will take care of me. Does she even know you're here? I left her a note. You're about to have a baby. A note should take care of things. Where did you leave it? How can you be sure she'll see it? Marina set her hand flat on the desk. I have been her assistant for ten years. I know where she keeps her messages. Nurse B said nothing, but her mind ticked off each person she'd call, who would then call someone else, the news spreading across the valley like the lighting of a giant Christmas tree. Okay, Marina said. Now can you show me to my room? I am Bia Tenai, as told to author. Marina had spent her whole nine mo ninth month in the office, rushing to finish work before the baby came. But in the Kelly house, anything was cool. Besides, she did one thing that was viewed with awe. She had these incredible dreams. She'd spend hours describing them. Stories about Chinese peasants, Mexican farmers, and people from the Revolutionary War. We loved listening to them. But when she got pregnant, she just concentrated on office work. This was a big disappointment. Some of us tried to coax her out of work mode, but the only one who could was this boy who knew how to sculpt bread. He made her sourdough flutes. And even though she'd never been musical, she took to those flutes like Bach to the organ. You know, I'd forgotten about those flutes till now, but I still can't remember that boy's name. Shit, that's going to drive me crazy. Nurse Regina Patchett, long of nose and long of legs, escorted Marina through the hallway toward her room. Light blazed with rare passion through the open doors. Oh my, look at the sun, she said to Marina. Unlike Nurse B, Patchett didn't see her job as a vehicle for gathering intelligence. In fact, though Patchett was married to the local minister, she never leaked out the slightest detail from the clinic to him, even when she knew it would embellish a sermon. 
Your baby picked a lovely day to come, Patrick said. The sun is so strong, I feel like I could touch it. Marina's face lit, then darkened, lit, then darkened, as she passed in front of successive doorways. I hope it doesn't take too long, she said. What's normal? That depends. How close are your contractions? The girl stopped. My what? Your contractions. The things that feel like cramps? Marina peered at the floor. When was the last cramp? When I signed in downstairs. How long have you been having them? The girl's eyes ran back and forth as if reading her past in the floor. I had one after dinner. Then I felt nauseous all night. The second cramp came this morning. That's why I figured it was time. So I walked here. And you didn't have problems walking? That's four miles. I felt a little tight in my chest. Your chest is not where you'd feel it. That was probably because you hadn't walked in a while. Any more cramps? Not yet. The nurse smiled. And I think you might be early. But you can relax in your room while we wait. We have a TV. Do you have a calculator? I said we have a TV. I heard you. It's color. We've even got remote control. I've never watched TV. Nurse Patchett's voice retreated before her mouth could grab on. Her trachea gave chase, finally rooting it out from a drawer marked deprived, where it huddled beside Life magazine images of starving children. Well, then let's just get you settled in. Marina can you continue down the hall. At least, she mumbled, it's during the day. Does the dark make you uncomfortable? No, it's just that the fall term ends this week, and night is the best time to tally up <coughs> grades. A choke suddenly cut the sentence short. Marina's eyes grew wide, and she clamped a hand on her chest. What's wrong, the nurse asked. The girl bent forward. I, I, I can't breathe. She sucked in air. Her face wrinkled in pain. Nurse Patchett shot a look up the corridor for help. All she saw was the sunlight. Oh, no! Marina wailed. She grabbed for the wall and leaned into it in gaps. The nurse bolted to a room. Urgent on two, she buzzed into the intercom. She shielded her eyes from the sun, decided not to wait for response, dropped the speaker, whirled back. Less than five seconds had passed. There, in the doorway, sprawled the pregnant girl, both hands on her chest. She gasped wildly as panic stormed across her eyes, like a drowning victim fighting for air. Marina Kelly original in code. Inside you is growing a magic girl, sang a man in my dream to me. Hooray, hurrah, that's great, I said. Let's hope, sang the man. We'll see. The first to come running to help was nurse Sammy Sampson, who'd been lingering over his Marvel comics when he heard the SOS. He flew up the stairway. Labor, he called to Patchett as he tore down the hall, the light strashing, flashing strobe light against the earthy color of his skin, the fuzz of his woolly hair. She was barely co contracting. She just collapsed. He dropped to his knees and felt the girl's neck. No pulse. Jesus, he cried. Get help. But he knew it was pointless. Dr. Twickcox wasn't due till tonight. And when he showed up, he'd be crocked. Doctors in Anthracite County are in chicken feed. All the clinic ever had was failures, drunks, and frauds. Twitcox was no exception. Samson grabbed for the girl's wrist. Pulse gone. Shit! He tilted the head, clamped nostrils closed, dropped his mouth to hers. He blew inside again, again, felt her arteries, but the beat was playing hooky. Christ! Pregnant women don't go like this. He pushed 15 times, and again, two breaths, 15 compressions, two breaths. And as he worked, his mind spiraled out from under him. Who the hell is this girl? Nurse Sampson had gone to the same schools as everyone in Anthracite County, and in his life lived a life of loose pants. And so he recognized all the ladies around. And sometime he would have seen this one, wouldn't he? No doubt about it, with red hair like that. What about her eyes? He opened his eyes. One compression. Looked at hers. Five, six. Her eyes were closed. Pulse still flat. He pounded at her chest. Stay professional. How many rounds? It was B. Talking. Sam held up five fingers and continued, then felt B's varnished hair rake against his arm. She was crouching beside him. Come here, B murmured. And then he felt Patchett there, too. Samson exhaled and gazed at the girl's face. Damn it, damn it, damn it. The pale tide of death was already rolling into her, staining her lips blue. He covered her mouth. She was so cold, he jumped. He pressed on anyway, but with each breath, her warmth kept receding until finally, finally, it was gone. With a cry, he threw himself against the wall. I can't get her. The other nurses had lowered their ears to the belly. She won't come back. Then Patchett looked at him. S -s -s Sam, she whispered. And then B touched his shoulder. 
and steered him back toward the body. What are you doing, he asked, as she pressed his head below the navel. I know the girl's pregnant. But when his ears touched the cold curve and B released him and said, listen, Sam, then he stopped resisting. He cupped his hands on the belly. Hear it, they asked. He pulled his ear away and lowered it again. He shifted to the chest, then returned to that spot. He sat up. It can't be, he said. We know, B replied. But there it was. They all heard it. In the body of a dead woman pulsed the heart of a living child. Jump Rope Song, author unknown. What made her come the way that she did? What kept her breathing? Gave us this kid. Entombed in the womb, cocooned, wrapped in gloom. Five, six, seven, eight. You better come out before it's too late. Above the clinic, storm clouds took over the sky and let loose in an orgy of rain. As the torrent began, Marina was moved to the room called intensive care. This meant it had monitors, but otherwise it was as pitifully equipped as the other rooms. Nurse Sampson sat with Marina, scrutinizing medical journals and sipping caffeine. Every few minutes, he checked through a stethoscope in her chest, silence. But then, down to the baby, a beat that could give Edgar Allan Poe a run for his money. Sam's logical faculties pushed it. But as the rain pounded harder and the sky grew darker, inside this dead woman, the stubborn little heartbeat drummed on. Nurse B called the Kelly home, but couldn't reach Miss Kelly. She's in class, an orphan told her. So she left the message that Marina was very, very sick, and Miss Kelly should get to the clinic at once. B then tried to reach Dr. Twitcox at home, only to be told the doctor was on the road which could mean he was at another clinic, or a bar, or was simply driving, his only companions some self-help tapes and his ten-gallon feet. Nurse B dialed her finger sore trying to find other help, but the doctors she reached were paid by the county, and county salaries were not worth the risk of flash floods or falling trees, and the one helicopter within flying range was in the shop. B conferred with Patchett and Sampson, but with malpractice lawyers, poised to snatch the last pennies off a dying town's eyes. The nurses agreed they wouldn't dare attempt a C-section themselves, so they had nothing to do but wait. At about three, Samson left Marina with Nurse Patchett and went to the clinic kitchen. There he flipped up a few pancakes and, beneath the roar of the rain, wondered about the dead girl. She wasn't married, he'd learned from Nurse B. She was the daughter of the famous but seldom encountered Edwina Kelly. She was 17. All the facts he could believe except the last, that she was unmarried, paid, no big deal. It wasn't as if a matrimonial contract was needed to gre grease the faucet of sexuality. As for the second fact, that Marina was Edwina Kelly's kid, no big deal again. Sure, Edwina Kelly could be as susceptible as anyone else to sensual pleasure. Clearly, she once had been. But it was hard to accept, given how she was, short and stout, severe as a general. Occasionally, when Miss Kelly brought orphans to the clinic, Nurse Sampson had tried to picture the woman in her youth. Through his mental viewmaster, he'd imagined he could see her as she'd been in New York, descending a grand stairway toward an elegant foyer, making her entrance to some social gathering, a ball, perhaps. Edwina would be in white with... <laughs> Edwina would be in white with bones so fine, guests would have trouble distinguishing her arms from the spindles on the banister. No way. Not Edwina Kelly. Not with her stiff-legged stride and stiff-faced demeanor. Chuck that image. Samson dropped in a new Viewmaster disc. Now, in consecutive slides, Edwina emerged again, but this time wearing her standard gray dress and work boots, stop-started her rigid legs down the stairs, and at the foyer, stiffened right out the front door in search of diversions more meaningful than a ball. He wondered how she'd been in her youth. It was hard to imagine her other than how she was now, stern and solid, a matron who came to town only to bring a child to the clinic. Oh, yes, and every year she went to the firehouse auction, bid on shoes and blankets, sped the necessities to the home. 
Though a few times, Sam remembered, she'd stunned folks at the auction by dropping wads on frivolous items, beaded gloves, pogo sticks, an oversized teddy bear, an undersized carousel, a fleet of unicycles, some geriatric cars. Each time that happened, the town's collective gasp hovered until someone remembered that the firehouse had spiked the punch again. You could almost hear the gasp melt into a phew once folks chalked up the aberration to that. Bob Mooney, letter to the editor, Vanity Fair. We loved growing up in the home. Miss Kelly raised us to be what she called knights of the world. People who went into the world, which she referred to as a battlefield, to do good turns for others. To be a knight, you had to master two things. One was the traditional chivalrous qualities, charity, valor, self-sacrifice. The other was battle skills, but not traditional battle skills. Our weapons, Miss Kelly taught us, are ourselves. In other words, the harder we strove to develop ourselves, the more effective we'd be on the battlefield. She helped us do that, however that might be. Plus, she gave us a freedom most kids can't even imagine. Though I don't mean Miss Kelly was never judgmental. It just wasn't in a way that restricted us. Her judgments came only when we restricted ourselves. What are you doing? I remember her asking once. Rick had some Disney coloring books from the five and ten. We froze. Miss Kelly strode down the living room, eyeing us. We all held our breath. At the far end, she said, coloring books are for people who want walls. Do you want walls? Rick said, no. Do you? She asked me. I said, no, too. One by one, we all did. Then she snatched the books away and stacked them in her arms. Ah, oh, she said. Disney, maybe his crew was creative, but that doesn't mean you should take his ideas for your own. You are all you, not anyone else, she sighed. Get up, she said. We rose, slouched and scared. Are you a Xerox machine? She bellowed. No, we replied in unison. Well, she said, hitching the coloring books under her arm. Then stop acting like one. She turned and marched out. Now, Samson thought, when it came to the third fact, that Marina was 17, that made the nurse shudder. 17, pregnant, not so hard to believe. They'd had girls that age before. But dead, fini, kaput, right in the clinic, before their eyes, with pills and know-how and Sam's own please, please, aching to the bottom of his mission. No, that couldn't happen. 17? The pounding of the rain hit rock concert decibel. He shoveled in a pancake. It tasted like silt. He peered out the window. Fog spread eagled across the valley. Ribbons of rivers were writhing down the single road out of town. He swallowed and was pivoting away from the window when he spied something moving onto the parking lot. A corps of soldiers, it looked like, marching beneath umbrellas. Sam stepped closer to the glass. The soldiers were not chanting, and their feet even as they struck the asphalt, did not make a sound. But how could they? These soldiers were wearing sneakers. It's the Kelly kids, he said, and bounded down the hall. By the time he reached the receiving desk, the marchers were crossing the parking lot. Sam could make out the boy who broke his nose last month, the girl he once treated for sunburn. And that had to be Edwina Kelly in the lead. There they were, the famous stiff legs of the head of the Kelly home. Kids in Sam's school used to imitate her, bend one's knees as little as possible, hold one's arms straight, even in the swing. Sam watched until the phalanx padded up the marble steps like 40 wet whispers, and when he opened the door, the children and Miss Kelly were standing beneath the hospital awning. Edwina Kelly, he said, I'm one of the nurses involved with your daughter's case. Please, may I have a word with you? Miss Kelly glanced at the orphans. Stay here, she said. Sam held the door for her. I've just relieved the nurse on duty, he said, his head down, afraid his bloodshot eyes would betray his fib. You do know your daughter is very ill. Yes. They stood in the front hall. And you know that she is in the family way? Yes. You know this? Do you take me for blind? No, I didn't mean any offense, Miss Kelly, but things are a little nutty here today, and I just got on shift. So you said. And your daughter is in intensive care now. That's why we're here, to be with Marina. Ma'am, not many people are allowed into intensive care. Then we'll take <coughs> turns. 
We need to give her our strength. I don't know if that'll be possible. I'll just have to clear it with the doctor then. Samson looked to his feet. There's no doctor here yet. Miss Kelly glared at him. Then she glanced away. And for a moment her eyes widened as if she just remembered something and a darkness unfurled across her face. But then she blinked away what she was feeling. If no doctor's around and we're ready to care for her, I don't see any problem. I... Will you show me the way? Ma'am, I think there's something I should tell you first, he said. And before Miss Kelly replied, he thought he saw the darkness again. It, she, it seemed to shut her up from within and to pass beneath her skin like a tremor. But then it was gone. And it stayed gone as he cracked his knuckles and took a deep breath. It stayed gone as he explained as best he could what had happened. And it stayed gone after he finished and stood waiting to hear her grief. All he saw was a slow nodding of her head. All he heard was her silence. Kit Lincoln and Caboodle Davis, two home residents, as interviewed on Lifeline. Miss Kelly called us inside the clinic and told us about Marina. We just wailed our guts out, except Miss Kelly. She never cried in front of strangers or laughed. She was totally no nonsense until you knew her. But she was frowning and kept wringing her hands, so we knew she was in agony. She told us there was hope for the baby, but it took us a while to calm down. Around five, we went into the room and stood around the bed. The only sound was the baby monitor beeping. There was a male nurse looking over Marina, a black man, Samson, of course, and suddenly I felt embarrassed we'd come empty-handed. I told Kit we should have brought her something. And Samson must have overheard, because he gave us his look. And then he nodded slow, like he was mulling it over. Later, he ran home and brought back a tray of miniature roses. Gorgeous red roses with petals as small as fingernails. He put pins through the stems so we could wear them. We asked where he'd gotten them. A flower store? He said, that'll be the day. Bouquets from florists hose you into catatonia. I'm a nurse, I know. But these babies just tickle the nasal passages, see? We took a whiff and he was right. Their fragrance was much less sweet, he explained. He bred flowers. And these were his own special genetic mix. I asked how come they smelled so different from other roses. Was it because of their size? Miss Kelly was pinning a rose to someone's collar just then, and she looked up to listen. And Sam said, these roses are further down the odor spectrum. <laughs> Didn't anyone ever tell you about the odor spectrum? He caught Miss Kelly watching and winked at her. It's like the light spectrum, but for the nose. We got a good giggle. <laughs> and Miss Kelly smiled just enough to show he'd won her respect. At midnight, seven hours late, Dr. Twitcox docked at the clinic. Twitcox was a bald sack of a man whose belly lopped like a swollen abscess over the tourniquet of his belt. In from the rain, he shuffled his six-foot-four self, prepared to do no more than culture a strep. He was thus quite unprepared for what awaited. Fifteen children sprawled around the waiting room, and Nurse B, erupting from behind the front desk, You're here! We've got an amazing situation, Doctor. I can't even describe it. You've got to see it. I mean her. I mean them. Come, this way. Hold on, woman, Dr. Twitcock said, but Nurse B tugged him like a barge into the hallway. This was not entirely due to reluctance. Twitcox always moved as if his feet were made of cement. The only shoes that fit such mammoth feet was acrobat slippers, which is what he wore. But Dr. Twitcox did not handspring gracefully across the gymnasium of life. He lumbered, he stumbled, he brooded, he sat. The only acrobatics he did were in his mind, where he looped through slogans he learned on self-help tapes, meditations to combat a world he believed was conniving to do him in. Twitcock shuffled his Frankensteinian feet toward intensive care as Nurse B flapped her jaws. She walked in, young girl all ready to have a baby, well, not exactly ready, but would be soon, and then she collapsed, and we tried to resuscitate, but it looks like heart failure, massive heart failure, and doctor, the feet is held on. You can make out the heartbeat clear as... You can what? Dr. Twitcock said. He couldn't have heard that right. His ears were playing tricks on him. Couldn't she give him a minute to clear the storm out of his head so he could hear? 
He'd been drinking with the rain pounding, and it was still pounding, and he couldn't even picture what she was saying. Small miracle you ever got through med school. Can't even find that gin in your own car, let alone make sense of a medical What emergency. was he thinking? Remember those self-help tapes? You are Dr. Fig Newton Twitcox, son of a doctor, upright and sincere, slayer of sickness, hero of the helpless, keeper of the American way. Let me make sure I am grasping this amazing situation, the doctor said. How old is the mother? Seventeen, and was. She didn't make it. Was? Do you know what you're suggesting? Yes. The girl had no history of heart trouble. Now she's dead and the baby's alive. It's mystifying. We moved her here. Nurse B pushed a door open. Inside stood five children, a middle-aged lady, and nurses Patchett and Sampson, and every last one of them was wearing a miniature red rose. What's this? Dr. Twitcock said. You bandage chaos. Land spheres seize the bull by the horns. And then, looking back to Nurse B, are these people sick? No, no, they're family, B said. Well, sort of family. Twitcox's gaze hopped from one set of eyes to the next. You bribed your way through med school, and the whole time they laughed at you. Moron! Puny brain! And tried positive visualization, but the only imaging he could squeeze out was the AMA glowering at him with hands planted firmly on its hips. He hooked his finger inside his collar and shaved off a film of sweat. Then he inserted advanced self-help into his thoughts and cranked up the volume. You are the poo-poo of snickering, the paragon of placidity. And, back in control, prescribed, remove these people. The intruders departed, closing the door behind them. Dr. Twitcox turned to the nurses. Now, explain. Nurse Sampson said, we can't, but the fetus is alive. You can see for yourself. He motioned toward the monitor. The umbilical cord ceases operating post-mortem, Twitcock said. Evidently, your machine has malfunctioned, but we... They do teach the umbilical cord in nursing school, yes? Nurse Sampson held out a stethoscope. Listen, he said. Twitcox had never liked tests. Besides, he was tired from driving and couldn't concentrate with all the rain. And was the gin in the car, or had he finished it in coal belt? Assess the situation. Right. You can do it. You can come out on top. Best defense is a good. Here, sir, Samson said, waving the stethoscope. Twitcox reached for the limp instrument and clamped in the ear tips. Then he pressed the stethoscope to the woman's abdomen. He sighed and was about to roll his eyes when he heard it. Pump, pump. He picked up the instrument and landed it again. Pump, pump. He glanced at the nurses. He moved the stethoscope to the mother's chest. Flat sound of death. It could not be. Remain calm at all times. This is some kind of trick, he said. It's not. It's not, he heard. He closed his eyes and popped in super self-help. But with the pulse coming through the ear tips and those voices pelting him, he could barely hear. You bandage chaos. Lands fear. Seize the boot by the corn. He sped it up. You are Dr. Fig Newton Twitcock, son of a doctor. Blasted the volume. Upright and sincere. Slayer of sickness. But when he opened his eyes and faced the nurses, the tape snapped and spun out of control. Cream, Cream of, of the, the crooks. crooks. King of the Kong! He threw down the stethoscope. Don't do this to me! It's not us, the male nurse said. And the lady nurses spat at him. It's true! And their tongues lashed out at him. Their eyebrows vibrated like cilia. The baby's alive! Accusations, lies, fabrications of a situation that's an impersonation of truth. Voices swarmed around him like wasps. Dunn's cap and dodo. A vivisection of his role, a bleeding of his soul. Get away, he shouted, flinging up his arms for a shield. They lunged at him, talons out. Wait, they cried. It's not possible. He backed up. They ran after him, shouting. The conspiracy, conspiracy strikes. The coup d'etat succeeds! Not possible! He whirled around and dived for the door. Room Corn Jerry, as told to the author. The doctor wasn't the only one who couldn't believe it, but at least we didn't take off like him. A grown man crashing into kids just to get down a hallway. Last we saw of him was his car squealing into the rain. Great, we thought, a hysterical Hippocratic, and people wondered why we scoffed at authority. When Marina had shown up at the clinic, she'd thought her baby was primed for its grand debut. But with her death and the rain, the child had tucked back into its dressing room. So the orphans and nurses waited. For two days they waited. Feet fell asleep. Tears watered the miniature roses. Voices consoled. When the orphans weren't near, 
Nurse B gabbled with her phone pals on one line, while Patchett, on another, cooed velvet nothings to her husband. When the nurses weren't near, the orphans distracted each other with parlor tricks. Noveline folded herself into invisibility. Catnip twisted her body into the most difficult contortions. Bronto wrestled color out of the carpet and then massaged it back in. But the orphans had seen all these tricks before, and their attentiveness soon dissolved into yawns. Something had to happen. Finally, late in the second day, the rain ceased. It ceased suddenly, as if a sheriff had banged at the door to the storm clouds' orgy. The clouds hauled on their skirts and zipped up their flies, threw their lights and amps into suitcases, and vamoosed out of town, leaving the sky to the return of the sunlight. The end of the storm startled the orphans, who'd lived with the black noise for two days. They peeked outside and reeled from the sun. Open the blinds, Samson told them, and Kitten Caboodle screwed the window wands until light stripes whiplashed the room. And as the sun struck Marina, the baby decided to come. The first sign was the quickening of the beep on the heart monitor. Blip, blip, beep, beep, beep. Samson tore down the hallway. A stampede returned to intensive care. Instructions were dispensed hastily, and the nurses, shot through with adrenaline, set Marina up for delivery. Patchett and Samson stood between the legs. B planted herself at the monitors. All around stood orphans, hands washed and ready. Now, someone asked. Now, Sam said. And wasting no time, he slipped his fingers into the cold inside Marina's body. It was soft still, but so very icy. He felt his way up the birth canal, his marvel at what was happening fading beneath the demands of the moment. When he got to her dilated cervix, he felt the infant's head. I've got it, he said, then wondered how to get it out. She's dead. She's dead. The thought stopped all logic. But before he could ask for ideas, he felt the child, without contractions or modern medicine or even a pair of forceps, begin to creep out. What the? Sam began, and then trailed off because coming into his hands, he could feel the head. He cradled the tiny bulge and then felt the neck surge forward. How was this happening? But he had no time to think. This kid wasn't crawling out. This kid was going for the six-inch dash. Sam backed down the birth canal as the infant tore pell-mell for the finish line. Then he yanked his hands into the room to clear the way. And then, before he could blink, into the room splashed the child, the head bearing a regular prune face, the body small and slippery and red, the legs, the feet. And when the last toe was out and she lay fully in his hands, this child from a dead woman let loose a piercing scream. He swung the howling infant up for all to see. It's a girl, B said. They all grabbed each other, laughing inside their crying, inside their laughing. Orphans and nurses flush shades of red that to this day have not been appropriated by Valentine cards. Even Miss Kelly, revealing to the nurses that she was not as mono-expressional as they thought, let herself go and wept. In the midst of all the hoopla, Nurse Patchett wiped her tears and held out her hands. I'll clean her, she said. Not yet, Samson said. The child was bawling like all newborns, and in every way, size, appearance, gestures, she was just like a newborn, except for one thing. She did not have a living mother. And for some reason that Sammy Sampson could not understand at that moment, logic and medical training absconded for parts unknown, and abandoned by them, all he had left was his heart. And he said to Nurse Patchett, let her touch her mother just this once. The child still in his hands, Sam backed away from the stirrups. He threaded himself through the orphans who quieted as he passed, and Miss Kelly, who watched, wiping her eyes. The orphans parted to let him reach the dead woman. There, on the bed, lay Marina, motionless and white, eyes closed forever. He held the child so the newborn faced her mother. The baby wiggled. Sam, tight Sam tightened his grasp on the tiny waist and whispered, this is your mother. Then he brought the child down and pressed her between the mother's breasts. And when the child's skin touched the skin of the dead woman, when the body of this new person came down on the corpse of the old, that's when it happened. 
the moment that since become a requisite dot on history book timelines, the moment we all think about when we hear the name Fossil Fink Falls, the moment that kicked off the very reason you're reading this book, the baby stopped thrashing, the room grew completely quiet, and as everyone froze, nurses gripping instruments, children hugging each other, Sam's hands holding the child's waist, Marina's eyes began to flicker. What's that? Patchett said, and the group moved closer. Marina's eyes fluttered clearly, and then she drew a breath. Color rose into the white face, and the room burst into shouting and tears. Marina inhaled a second time, and a third. Her heart monitor began beeping. Sweat bloomed on her forehead, and Samson rushed forward to pat it away. It's a miracle! It's a miracle, he cried, looking into Marina's beautiful gray eyes. So the child was named Celeste to signify the heavenly wonder of the moment. And that is how she became known by the world. Thank you.